When I shop for anything, I always watch reviews. And if the reviews seem a little too positive, I get annoyed. There's a place for uncritical praise, but it's not in reviews. I want to know why the haters hate and why the fanboys fanboy. And when it comes to board games, that feels doubly true. Except, even though I'm always looking for negative reviews, I frequently can't find them at all. Even Tom Bassel, who is well known for negative reviews, ultimately gives his seal of approval to about 80% of the games he reviews. But I wonder, why is that? What about board gaming makes negative reviews so rare? Especially when you compare them to video game reviews, which are far more negative, far more often. I've been thinking about this question for a while, and I think I finally have an answer worth sharing. Is it a conspiracy? Is it something else? Let's start with the elephant in the room. The ethics of gaming journalism. Even though board games are ancient, board game reviews are younger than most people watching this video. And there is no major board game media that could rival the size of big video game media giants. For example, the biggest board game reviewers, The Dice Tower, has less than 3% of the employees as IGN does. And while journalistic ethics has always been a huge point of concern for video games, especially in light of it becoming a $100 billion market, those same concerns haven't reached the world of board gaming quite yet. But before I get into too much detail, I have a story to share. The first board game review was posted in 2005 by Scott Nicholson on his channel, Board Games with Scott. Scott pioneered the format that most modern game reviews tend to follow, and even if you aren't familiar with his channel, you'd find his video style really familiar. Well, after doing it for years, he eventually chose to back out of game reviews altogether because he was putting far more into it than he was getting out. YouTube didn't pay for views back then, Patreon didn't exist yet, and there weren't really any other ways to monetize. So he had a choice. Start asking for money from publishers who are eager to get their games reviewed, or deny himself the easiest way to monetize his channel. He never took money for his reviews, and he eventually threw in the towel. Rest in peace, War Games with Scott. A few years after Scott Nicholson started his channel, Lance Mixter of Undead Viking started reviewing games on YouTube too. But while Scott Nicholson never took money from publishers, Lance Mixter did. As Kickstarter began to take off, publishers desperate for attention in a super crowded market offered him money for reviews, and he said yes. He even made it a policy to ask for money when publishers contacted him. It became well known in the industry that his channel accepted money for reviews. Lance has gone on the record many times to say that the content of his reviews weren't affected by money, but that he has accepted money from publishers. Lance's channel still exists and it's still doing well today. I think these two stories of how these two channels lived and died illustrates one of the major problems in game journalism. There is very little money in it, minus what publishers try to give you. And this is a huge problem. When Undead Viking started charging for his reviews, he tainted his reputation because he didn't understand journalistic ethics. Because even if he didn't review anything differently, because he was taking money for it, journalistic ethics are about preventing any potential reasons to doubt what he is saying. A conflict of interest doesn't mean someone's altering their review. They are meant to prevent any situation where someone will look compromised by money, to avoid situations where you look tainted in the first place. But accepting money for reviews isn't something that happens very often anymore. At least not publicly, since most reviewers are smart enough not to break the rules like that. But with an industry of publishers so willing to give out money for content, many reviewers have taken to accepting money for previews, which often use the same format as reviews, and certainly doesn't stop reviewers from including their opinion. But preview is a different word, right? We, we added a P. Well, at least they're clear about when they are and aren't accepting money, right? While that might seem fine on the surface, it's still not a good practice. See, the same companies whose products they review are giving them money for previews. That is a conflict of interest, even if it's not for the same video. The company whose products they review is still signing their checks. It doesn't take much imagination to imagine how this might affect their review. Just because that particular video wasn't bought doesn't mean that particular reviewer wasn't bought. And I'm not going to say any individual content creator has been compromised like this, 
at least intentionally. But according to journalistic ethics, even looking bot is a problem. Doing paid preview videos is an industry standard at this point. At the very least, game reviewers need to disclose every time they're writing a review for a company they take good money from. But ideally, anyone calling themselves a reviewer or a critic would never take money from the companies whose product they review. This includes previews, rule videos, even accepting free copies of games. At the end of the day, though, the other monetization options are so slim and so much more difficult to get started with, I think this is a case of publisher money being the path of least resistance for most board game reviewers. I certainly don't think it's an issue of conscious corruption, but even subconsciously, a reviewer might not want to publish a bad review for a game from a publisher that they've got a lot of money from. It's easy to imagine how these factors might link. But while the ethics situation is atrocious, it's far from the only factor that's leading to positive reviews on everything. In the world of board gaming, reviewers are almost all independent, working by themselves or as a partner. Virtually none of them have editors who assign games. And this is a stark contrast with how the video game world works, where journalists must play any game assigned to them. So when the reviewer chooses a game to review, they choose based on what sounds appealing to them. And for someone who plays games as prolifically as a reviewer does, they learn to filter for their taste pretty quickly. On top of that, reviewers put a lot of work and time into a review. They don't love the game, that work might not seem worthwhile. And that's not just conjecture. Plenty of popular game reviewers have said as much publicly, from Rado to Undead Viking and more. That means, ultimately, the only people left reviewing the games are the ones who love them enough to put the work into them. And it's not a coincidence that the people who review games are often people who want to work in the game industry. Some of them use it as a stopgap measure to network with creators in the industry so they can start making games themselves. If you're reviewing games to network yourself into the industry, every negative review could potentially be burning a bridge. Even if reviewers are not writing reviews just to network, the industry is small. Eventually, reviewers will become friends with publishers and designers, and once you do that, you're going to be much more hesitant to write reviews for games from people that you're friends with. The industry is just too small for these things not to happen, and without any oversight it can be a huge factor that biases both parties without either party even being aware. Lastly, board game publishing is very different in the world of video games because they're made differently. Video games are big productions. Coding is hard, management is hard, working with dozens of artists is hard, and when things go wrong, the stakes are high. An unfun mechanic might result in millions of dollars lost if you decide to remake it. As a result, lots of obviously bad mechanics are shipped in video games. In that way, board games are much easier to produce. First, they're typically made by a singular person working alone. That means there's very little reason to pursue bad ideas or bad mechanics, as they can get changed easily, cheaply, and frequently. The entire development cycle is done by independent designers who work purely on speculation. That means the risk of experimenting with new mechanics is on a designer, and the consequence of bad mechanics is on them too. But those consequences might mean a few hours of design work was lost, while for video games, a mechanics change might mean a multi-million dollar loss. Most board game designers don't do it full time, so they tend to take their time babying each game idea until all of it meets a very high standard. But just because board games are relatively easy to start designing doesn't make them easy to publish. In video gaming, publishing a game is very easy. You submit some files to an app store and you're done. That's not to say being a successful publisher is easy. You still have to market your game. But the floor is quite easy to reach even for a single developer working in their spare time. Most completed video games get published because of this, but when a board game is completed, they still face the daunting task of publishing the game, which requires a lot of money upfront for printing and shipping and warehousing costs. That means indie board games need to go through Kickstarter, which requires another set of expenses. Even modestly successful Kickstarters have big ad spends, big art costs, big printing costs, big shipping costs, etc. Which is all to say, board games are really hard to publish. Ultimately, all this means publishers have their pick of designs to publish, and only the highest quality games ever get made. 
when a truly terrible indie board game is made, it defied the odds. The bad gameplay got through playtesting, hundreds of discerning Kickstarter backers, the creator paid for marketing, learned or paid someone for shipping logistics, art direction, graphic design. We ask why board games are rarely reviewed negatively. In part, it's because there are just far fewer bad board games getting published. And honestly, truly terrible games are few and far between. Unfortunately, all this means there's a complex web of factors affecting reviews, and it's not easy to discern which biasing factor might be at play for any given review. But knowledge is power, and even being aware of these biases let you parse reviews in a more useful way. Is it a conspiracy? Well, kind of. You have creators working closely with their reviewers, passing money between each other, their friends and clients at the same time, and that dynamic is a dangerous one that mostly gets ignored even though it really shouldn't. At the end of the day though, even most badly reviewed games are decent. It's always easy to imagine how someone can have a really great time playing it. Hell, people have a great time playing Monopoly, and it was literally designed to be painful to play. Really, the best advice is just to trust your judgment, because board game media is probably not changing anytime soon. And maybe you could just try playing a game before you buy it, which means no more Kickstarters. Or not, you do you. If you enjoyed the video, please like, and if you are interested in the history of board games, uh, click the video in the corner. It is my magnum opus of board gaming history, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks for watching. I'm Jake Frondorf, and this is Cardboard Mountain.